so um, without further ado, I, I guess I'll, I'll get going here. So today's topic uh, is the use of high flow nasal cannula for our COVID-19 patients. And the reason we chose this topic was um, we've uh, started trying high, no high flow nasal cannula at CCTC, and I know probably we're gonna be starting doing that at uh, MedSurge ICU as well soon. And there were a lot of questions about it. So I thought we'll, we'll review this uh, topic today and uh, answer your questions. Let me just get... So um, as you know, COVID-19 uh, disease uh, leads to hypoxic respiratory failure. And from data emerging from China and Italy, we know that about 40 to 50% of these patients go on to develop something known as uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. Now, high flow nasal uh, can cannula is effective in managing acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. This is a study from uh, New England Journal of Medicine uh, from about five years ago, which looked at using high flow oxygen, uh, oxygen via face mask, or uh, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, essentially BiPAP, in patients who presented with hypoxemia, uh, but who were not hypercapping. So their CO2 was normal, they were not COPD patients. So you can see the, uh, the first column shows you the number of patients in each group, uh, about 100 patients in each group. And what you can see from the data here is that the use of high flow oxygen uh, reduced the uh, number of intubations uh, in these patients. So it was associated with the lowest uh, a rate of intubation uh, in these patients. Uh, but more importantly, it was also associated with uh, at least twofold decrease in mortality uh, at 90 days. So uh, I think as a result of this trial, high flow oxygen therapy has become a mainstay of, for uh, managing uh, acute hypoxic respiratory failure, at least uh, initially. But there are certain concerns with the use of this uh, uh, modality in COVID-19 patients. The first one uh, is generation of aerosols, and that you know putting high flow nasal cannula on somebody on a patient with COVID would result in uh, generation of these aerosolized uh, infectious particles, which puts uh, the healthcare providers at risk. And the second one is uh, that using high flow nasal cannula in these patients actually delays intubation and the patients are quite hypoxic as we all have seen in our units. Now that may or may not be a problem. And you can see here in the picture, that's Scott Anderson. Uh, and these are his SATs, 66%. And I'll talk a little bit about, about that uh, later on. So, Thinking about how we can mitigate uh, the concerns uh, of using high flow nasal cannula in our COVID patients. Uh, first, uh, with respect to aerosol generation, um, one way to mitigate this risk is putting a face mask over the high flow nasal cannula, which should reduce the dispersal of uh, droplets. Uh, and then also limiting, uh, limiting the use of high flow nasal cannula to environments where we would be wearing enhanced PPE. So uh, this would be negative pressure rooms in our ICUs or elsewhere in the hospital uh, or special dedicated COVID-19 wards. So we recently opened a uh, ward uh, on D5200 at Victoria Hospital. It's the respirology ward and the entire ward is negative pressure. And this is the picture on the right shows uh, one of the nurses turning on the switch to uh, make the entire ward negative pressure. So, so um, we are working with, uh, with our colleagues from Respirology to, to create spaces where the use of uh, high flow nasal cannula would be safe uh, for our staff, um, both because we'll have negative pressure environments and also we'll be wearing the enhanced PPE. The second uh, thing with would like to uh, deal with is does it actually delay intubation uh, and what's the effect of hypoxia on these patients? So while intubating the patient and putting them on a mechanical ventilator makes them look more comfortable, intubation does come at a cost. As you all are aware, uh, 
sed uh, intubated patient that requires sedation, paralysis, they're immobilized despite our best efforts to uh, incorporate physiotherapy, and they're at risk of developing uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia. Um, and this, of course, is, uh, you know, uh, affects both the patients uh, in terms of uh, worse functional outcomes, cognitive outcomes, and high mortality. But more importantly, in a setting of a pandemic, it can rapidly deplete our ventilator pool, uh, ICU resources, including ICU beds, uh, nurses, and RTs. And we can quickly run out of sedation and uh, paralyzing agents. So there are reports in some hospitals where they're running short on their stocks. So the next question is, um, is, hypo is hypoxemia that bad? So when, when, we, when we look at um, uh, our patient with COVID who's sitting on high flow nasal cannula, sats are in the 80s or 70s, how bad is that for the patient? So I will have to revert a little bit to my background in respiratory and cardiopulmonary physiology here. And so uh, we'll, we'll have some equations here on, on, on the board, but I'll walk you through them. So the purpose of cardiovascular system, cardiorespiratory system, is to deliver oxygen to tissues. And this is known as oxygen delivery. This is the DO2 here. And delivery of oxygen to tissues is a function of cardiac output and arterial oxygen content. If we break down this arterial oxygen content uh, uh, component of this equation further, we see that it's made up of hemoglobin concentration, oxygen saturation, and the partial pressure of oxygen. But this, this value is gonna be very small because of this factor here. So if it's SATs we're after, how much SATs, uh, how much oxygen saturation do we need to actually effectively deliver enough oxygen to meet our metabolic demands. So this is a busy graph, but I'll walk you through this on the right, okay? So on the y-axis, you have oxygen delivery, okay? This is how much oxygen is being delivered to your tissues. And on the x-axis here, you have different levels of oxygen, oxygen saturation. So if you look at the red line, as you increase your oxygen saturation, you increase your oxygen delivery to tissues. And the important uh, point on this graph is this dotted line called critical oxygen extraction uh, fraction. So this is the point of how, uh, at which uh, you no longer meet the oxygen demands of the tissue, right? And you can see that that corresponds to SAS just below 40%. Now, this is in otherwise healthy individuals, obviously with no prior coronary disease or uh, uh, and, you know, any other complications. And so uh, perhaps this, this target would be a little bit higher in, in those individuals. But overall, you can see that oxygen levels, uh, oxygen sats of 80 to 70% would still be enough to meet the oxygen demand of uh, uh, our patients in general. And that explains why Scott Anderson was so happy in that photograph with the SATs of only 66%. So the, the, the other thing I wanted to take up is, uh, can we predict a failure of high flow nasal cannula in our patients? And to do that, we can use something called the ROX index. And the ROX index essentially is uh, oxygen saturation divided by your fractional concentration of oxygen, so FiO2, divided by respiratory rate. So what you can tell from this equation is if your respiratory rate goes up, if the patient is really uh, dyspneic and short of breath, the respiratory rate would go up and this number would get smaller, okay? So from previous studies, we can see that and if you do this ROX index at two, six, and 12 hours, ROX index less than 2.85, 3.47, 3.85 at these different time points predicts uh, failure and requirement for intubation in these patients, right? So uh, if your ROX index is greater than 4.88, you can just continue to observe your patient on uh, high flow nasal cannula therapy. 
So how can we optimize oxygenation further in patients uh, who are being treated with high flow nasal cannula? This is a picture of a patient from CCTC um, about two weeks ago who presented to us with COVID pneumonia and hypoxic respiratory failure. We put him on high flows and nasal cannula, but his initial requirements were 90% oxygen on 60 liters. So we decided to prone him, and because he was fully awake, not short of breath, and uh, happy to participate, and he had a cell phone, we would call into the room and ask him to, hey, can you turn on your tummy and stay there for as long as you can, because it's gonna help your oxygen levels. And so he did. And this is what happened to his uh, PF ratios. The, uh, on the y-axis here, you have PF ratios, which is your oxygenation uh, effectiveness. I guess the high ratios being better oxygen levels. And on the x-axis here, you have the time from ICU admission. The red lines indicate the time when we asked him to prone. So you can see he is sitting with PF ratios of 100, which is pretty much severe AR ARDS, right? And when, he, when the patient goes into prone position, uh, their PF ratio improves. Then he turns back, it comes down. He turns again, it improves. He turns uh, back to supine, it, it falls. And so you, you get these cyclic improvements in oxygenation. At some point, two days into his admission, uh, when we prone him, there was no improvement in oxygenation and we couldn't figure out why. And then it turned out that he developed some blood clots in his posterior, posterior uh, nasal passages. And once he blew out his nose, literally, his uh, oxygenation improved again and, and started to respond to, to proning. So this is an example of, of a patient that uh, was uh, just in our, C, in our unit at CCTC. And after four days of this therapy, he was able to be discharged to the respirology ward. Uh, with that, they need to get uh, to, to having been intubated. So he avoided intubation. So how does proning work in ARDS? And so this is a schematic. Uh, on the left side, you'll see uh, uh, the patient in supine uh, position, and this is in prone position. And you could think of lung tissue as this uh, spring or coil suspended from the top of the lung here. And this is us looking at the patient from, from their feet, standing in the patient's feet, looking uh, into them, right? So this is, the, this is the right lung, this is the left lung. And you can imagine that the, uh, we see a spring that's suspended from the top of the lung here. And uh, uh, when the patient is supine, the gravitational uh, forces, as well as the density of the tissue, is marching greater in the dependent regions and in the dorsal regions of this lung. And so this results in compression of lung tissue here. And so if we look at individual alveoli or the uh, gas exchange units in the lung, uh, they uh, are more open at the top of the lung and more compressed at the bottom of the lung, which uh, impairs your matching between ventilation and, and perfusion. When we prone the patient, okay, this is on the right-hand side, we see that there is a... Uh, improved distribution of lung tissue because the spring is now unlo unloaded and that improves the geometry of the alveoli in the lung and most of the perfusion in the lung goes to these dorsal regions of the lung which improves oxygenation so that's the physiology behind how proning works recent reports from Italy suggest that the ARDS that COVID-19 patients develop is actually not typical uh, ARDS that we are used to seeing uh, following sepsis or your usual influenza. And what we're seeing in this type of ARDS is this dissociation between relatively well-preserved lung mechanics and the severity of hypoxemia. So patients are pre presenting, they're very, very hypoxic, they're usually not dyspneic, so they're not feeling short of breath, initially at least, and their lung mechanics are normal, so they have normal compliance. So they suggest that the oxygenation increases with prone positioning are not primarily due to recruitment of the lung tissue when we prone them, which is the usual mechanism in ARDS, but instead due to redistribution of perfusion in response to pressure 
uh, and or gravitational forces. So, so there is actually some uh, data backing up what we are proposing uh, from, from uh, European centers. So uh, just to summarize the benefits of high flow nasal cannula and patient self pronin in COVID-19 patients, you have your patient center benefits. We avoid sedation and paralysis. The patients are able to speak to their family. Our patient was able to chat to his family and friends using his cell phone. They're, they're, they're able to participate in physiotherapy, get out of bed for brief periods of time. They can maintain oral nutrition. And all of this obviously may improve their functional and cognitive outcomes. We don't know yet. More like We need to do research on this, but hopefully that's the, that's the benefit there. We also have system benefits. Uh, by, by using this strategy, we're preserving our ventilator pool for the sickest patients. We preserve our ICU capacity in terms of nursing and, and uh, beds uh, available. And we're gonna conserve our sedative and paralytics for those, again, those sickest patients who need intubation and mechanical ventilation. So in summary, um, we ask you to consider using high flow nasal cannula uh, and self proning in COVID-19 patients with hypoxic respiratory failure and normal worker breathing. You can mitigate the risk of aerosol generation by placing the face mask over uh, uh, above the cannula. Uh, you obviously will have to wear enhanced PP and this would have to be done in negative pressure rooms in the ICU or in COVID-19 dedicated wards. And we can ask you guys to, to do a, this ROX index uh, at two, six, and 12 hours to decide whether the patient is getting better or worse and whether they are moving to, uh, towards intubation uh, to hopefully help you guide uh, decisions with respect to uh, uh, endotracheal intubation. And that's all I had for today. Uh, please follow us on Twitter at Critical London there and on our YouTube channel. 